we're definitely happy to be here. Very excited. Hopefully, give you some good information to let the show up. Uh, my name is John Sanders with Karis Corporation, and we're going to review using sucrox liquid permanganate as a processing aid in the sugar industry. Uh, outline of the presentation, uh, we'll go over briefly Karis involvement in sugar processing. Uh, then we'll go into sucrose loss during sugarcane processing. Uh, we'll look at the benefits that we've observed from the last couple of seasons working with sucrox on equipment clarification, uh, juice purity improvements, as well as some reduced evaporator fouling, and then we'll top it off with some future work. And also, there will be some slides on some research that the USDA, who we've worked very closely with over the past several years, uh, she's got some slides, Stephanie Boone, that she's gonna review at the end. And before I get into everything, I'm gonna get all my acknowledgements out of the way so I don't forget anybody, but this definitely couldn't happen uh, without the help of B. Chopik Company, Ivan Chopik, David Hatcher, obviously all of, a lot of people from Karis, the USDA, LSU, who provided us equipment for a jar testing study that we did that we'll get into, as well as the mills. Without access to the mills, without mill buy-in participation, uh, that definitely wouldn't be possible. So I want to thank y'all up front. All right, looking at uh, Kara's sugar industry milestones, we actually got into it. When we got into this, we found out back in the 60s, uh, we had a US patent for sugar purification process. And more recently, over the last five years, we've been working uh, along with the USDA, working with sugar mills uh, on a lot of operational improvements. Uh, since 2015, we've done a collaborative collaborative work with the USDA uh, in the Louisiana sugar mills. In 2017, we kind of did some limited trials at three mills. Uh, and then in 18, this past crop, we had pretty much full-scale treatments at five different sugar mills. Uh, the Sucrox product <coughs> is grass approved. It carries halal kosher certifications. And as we're going to get into, we definitely uh, saw some significant improvements in a number of areas. And all of this research in every one of these areas is always going on. There's, there's more to learn, more to find out. What is sucrox? Besides just being a purple chemical, it's a permanganate blend. Um, it's a strong oxidizing product. So it's in the same family of class with your chlorine, chlorine dioxide, hydrogen peroxide, things of that nature. Uh, but what's special about it is it's selective. Um, it's not going to go after the saturated bonds and degrade sucrose, fructose, propane, different stuff like that. Um, so it's selective. It goes after unsaturated compounds, double and triple bonds. Uh, as I mentioned, it's an oxidizer. It's very, very stable. Uh, it's safe, it's easy to use, and because of the purple color, when it reacts, you're going to see a color change. So when there's a reaction going on, you get a color change, and it gives you a good visual of what's going on. However, there's no problem with side reactions, hazardous gas releases, any hazardous byproducts, and the reactions are very fast. It oxidizes sulfides and phenolic compounds. Uh, obviously iron and manganese on the water treatment side, but it reacts very fast in all of these reactions. Now, the big problem that we start to focus on, sucrose loss. Big problem, cane degradation. Obviously yesterday we had heard a presentation talking about conditions and how difficult they were with the mud, with all the rain every three days. Uh, we were out in it too, so I definitely can't argue that. Um, but the deterioration, obviously, as you guys know, leads to a lot of issues with the mills. Sucrose inversion, dextran penalties, increased chemical costs to try to, to, try to fight these issues. Uh, some of the degradation byproducts, you got organic acids, dextran, oligosaccharides, mannitol, ethanol. And these byproducts cause problems for the factories, as you guys know, again, more clarification, increased viscosity, crystal formation issues and elongation, uh, issues with centrifuge operations and high purity molasses. 
And the large majority of this occurs after post-harvest, sitting out in the yard, being brought in from the field, lying around the deterioration starts to, you know, exponentially get worse as time goes on. Now, I'm going to go into the, some of the benefits uh, quickly through the first set of slides is the sanitation benefits. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the knives. Uh, this was at a mill that had a pause in the processing, so they took it upon themselves to change out their knife blades. When they went in, they called us over there, and some of the contract workers that do this for them, along with mill personnel, were they were amazed. They're like, these are really, really clean compared to previous times when they opened it up. They were filthy, a lot of slime, a lot of material up on the blades, uh, but from we have been feeding the Sucrox product, nice and shiny, no slime at all. So that was definitely a, an observation made by those personnel. Uh, the next one's milling equipment. Uh, this is a cush chain drag. Again, same mill. The, the picture on the left is the more conventional treatment, your dexamase, biocide, MLAs. And as you can see, there's a lot of material, there's a lot of slide, the picture really doesn't even do it justice. It was, it was pretty dirty. And then we turned the Sucrox on, and 48 hours later, that's the same area of the cush chain drag. So, very clean, very little slime, uh, a big noticeable improvement, and again, a lot of feedback from mill personnel. Uh, they definitely noticed that. Uh, this is from the same mill, uh, again another rotary screen, picture on the left is without sucrox of being fed throughout the mill, the picture on the right is the rotary screen treated, so you can definitely see there's, there's a noticeable difference in the amount of slime deposits and buildup. Alright, the next one I'm going to is some clarification work we did, this first slide was from a short series of trials we did in 2017 at a mill uh, where we were mainly just looking at turbidity and clarification. We fed the sucrox, as you can see in that picture, it was just before the clarifier, just before polymer addition. So very quick, the pure function of it was to see what happened in the clarifier. This mill had two identical clarifiers and there was a way to isolate one of them so we could feed sucrox the other one wouldn't get the wouldn't get the sucrox benefit, so we wanted to compare uh, turbidities and things of that nature. So we did two different trials. They only went for a couple of days each. However, um, one of the clarifiers, the first trial was 10 parts per million as product, and then we raised it up and did 15 parts per million uh, for the second trial. And if you look at the lines, the red line is showing the turbidity over time through the sampling that contains no sucrox feed, that clarifier, and then the blue line is the clarifier that did have sucrox fed to it. And overall, there was a big reduction. And the thing about this mill, most of this time during these trials, unfortunately, but fortunately, <coughs> excuse me, they were coming off of upsets. So the turbidity was very, very high, uh, as you would expect from the downtime. But when you tracked it, coming down and they settled out and everything got to a steady state, the turbidity with the sucrox being fed, that clarifier was substantially, you know, anything from 30 to 50 NTUs lower. So we definitely saw a difference. And then the bottom slide here shows with increased dosage, you can see the settling and you can see the flocculation in these tubes. So that's kind of an indicator of what's going on. The second thing we did, we did this trial in 2018, uh, different mill, but what we wanted to look at was the interaction with sucrose being fed versus not being fed, and what does it do for clarification, what does it do for settling, turbidity, things of that nature. So what we did is we fed for six hours, and then we turned it off for six hours. The average feed was 12 and a half parts per million as product of sucrose. And the polymer was the mill polymer, polymer that they always use on a daily basis. We made that down into a solution to feed it. And what we noticed is, and we'd sample flash heated juice after the six hour period. So as soon as the six hours was over, we got the flash heated juice. And the next slide we'll show is the jar tester that LSU let us use. 
which was able to keep the temperature the same. We wanted to keep the conditions the same, keep it hot like it is in the clarifier to simulate the conditions. And what this graph shows is these purple ones in front, and we measured settling times at one minute, two minute, and five minute intervals. And the graphs show that, the one minute, two minute, three minute, and um, five minute, excuse me. And what you can see is the purple lines are obviously when Sucrox was on and being fed, we see a faster settling rate, and then the next slide you'll see we had lower turbidities. And this is kind of what we wanted and expected because <clears throat> the permanganate aspect of Sucrox has a good synergistic relationship with the polymer. So it's not uncommon to feed it in, in different industrial sites and it'll lower the amount of polymer that needs to be done yet still <coughs> achieve the same results. So there's a potential for savings and I know the polymer guys out there may not want to hear that, but if it's a benefit to the mill, you never know. So that's kind of what we were looking at in this specific instance. And one other thing to note is it looks like, you know, up here on the highest dose which the mill is operating, but you can move over and the next slide shows that we were able to lower the polymer dose and still get the same type of settling results, turbidity results, which was great because they can cut back and that's obviously a savings form. This is the, this one has the five minute settled turbidity on, on the Y axis. The X axis again is off and on when we fed Sucrox, when we didn't for those six hour periods. And again, as you can see, there's a 15 to 20% turbidity decrease uh, when the Sucrox was being fed. All right, next topic, we're gonna look at juice purity loss and reduced juice purity loss from our observations for the past couple of seasons uh, with mills feeding sucrox and not feeding sucrox. This is kind of a busy slide, but the two on the left is from the same mill. Uh, one of it is 2016, the other is 2017. Uh, day, 2016, there was no sucrox fed. 2017, they fed the entire crop. The blue line is the crusher juice purity. The red line is the mixed juice purity. And you can see in 17 when they fed, the red line overtakes the crusher juice purity. So we're improving that mixed juice purity and narrowing that gap of the loss. On the right side, that's a separate mill from 17 when they didn't feed any sucrox to 18 this past crop, they did feed sucrox. And if you look at the average purity difference, it goes from 1.3% down to about a half percent. So again, we're increasing we're decreasing that gap, and on average, the purity improved by 0.8% for the crops that were treated with, with sucrox. Um, this, is, this is another mill, it's the same mill that was on the right. This is kind of a screenshot of the season. They fed sucrox basically early October to early December, and the average purity difference was about 0.8%. <clears throat> Then they had sanitation chemicals that they'd already bought before we ever started there. They wanted to feed them out, money already spent. So we did that, we continued to take the data and you can see that average purity difference went way up, 1.55%. So it basically doubled when they went off the product, which was very interesting information. And one of the things uh, we were thinking about, well, are we doing something to the crusher juice? Are we decreasing the crusher juice? And that's what's changing the gap. But as you look, this is an example, and we have more slides that show when the sucrox is on, there's your crusher juice, and then there it is when it's off. Basically the same, the same average percentage, so which shows we're not really having an effect, a negative effect on crusher juice. Rather, we're closing the gap the other way with uh, increases in mixed juice. And then here's the, yeah, I should put them off, sorry. Uh, the mixed juice purity, you got the same crusher juice, but then you've got a drop in the mixed juice purity when the sucrox was off. And then the final thing on the right shows the gap percentage. So you see the in big increase in the mixed juice purity uh, when the sucrox was off, the difference between the crusher juice and mixed. And then we, we went and Dan and Sam and guys from our team, we've got all the data, some data, and we looked at all the mills uh, 
2017-2018 crops. And the y-axis is juice purity loss, crusher minus mix. And on the x-axis, the left side, n equals 18, refers to nine mils, two crops apiece. Uh, the right side, n equals four, those are mills that fed two crops, two mills doing two crops apiece. And what you can see is the ones without the two crops are way up here, you got over a 1.2% difference. The ones that fed two crops were up there again, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, a substantial difference uh, when you look at that. Now what does all this mean? What's the potential significance? Uh, what's the value that this can potentially bring? Uh, we looked at this and this is still, we're still ongoing getting some data, but we kind of got a model with one of the mills that we work with. And again, the y-axis is percent sucrose recovered. The x is mixed use purity. Some assumptions that were made, extrication is 95, molasses purity 36, sugar purity 99.7. So those are the assumptions made under the model, but if you track it and you look at that difference, we come out to be, something missing, there we go. Oops. Uh, we look at that 0.8% difference gap on the mixed juice purity, and we come over here and look at the sucrose recovered, and we turn out to be a 0.6% sucrose recovery. Again, we, these need to be repeated and continued but that's a lot of good information uh, if that's indeed happening. Uh, the last thing I'm going to go into, some benefits, is what we saw around evaporators. Um, we kind of discovered this in 17 at a mill and got a lot of feedback. <clears throat> they ran longer, they had <clears throat> you know, improved cleanings, reduced chemical costs, so that was something we definitely wanted to target uh, to see if we can repeat that. So here's a picture of uh, sucrose reduced evaporator fouling. Again, at a mill, the top, you know, without sucrose, it ran for, you know, a cleaning cycle. We got samples of it in pictures, and then with sucrose. And what we noticed is the the scale definitely changed. Without sucrose, we had a very hard, uh, hard white type scale, very difficult to get off sometimes. With sucrose. It was very, it was almost like mud. It was very liquidy, soft, easy to remove, and a lot of the feedback we got were, you know, it was over a 50% reduction in the amount of material it took to clean it as compared to previous cleanings, previous seasons, when sucrose wasn't being fed. So that was definitely interesting. And here's a study, and again, thank you to David Hatcher uh, with Beach Helpic for doing the legwork, getting these samples uh, that we could get analyzed. But the point of this, not only the microscopy pictures, is we look at before sucrose, these are what they, out of the sample, what they identified as some of the materials that were found. And then on the right column, we have them when we fed sucrose for a period, uh, basically a cleaning cycle. And the thing that stands out the most is a reduction in the silica which as you guys know, silica deposits are some of the hardest things to clean uh, off of a surface compared to calcium and calcium sulfate, calcium and things of that nature. And the calcium increased, so we're seeing a reduction in a difficult thing to clean, and we may see a little bit more of the deposits of the calcium, but overall it was a much simpler cleaning process. And again, from the same mill, uh, this is a different time, a different final body, different set of evaporators, but you see the same thing. You see a big reduction in the silica, and you see the increase in the calcium. So it was repeated, we saw it on several occasions, and we got this type of feedback from several of the mills, and this is exactly what we were seeing in 17 at the mill that we had. Now what's going on with that? Why are we why are we seeing what we're seeing? Well, we have we have a couple of theories. Uh, one of them looks at the biofilm formation. Obviously, you get dextrin in the factory, you get the polysaccharides, you get the biofilm formation. Um, that's a sticky surface, difficult. Deposits are going to stick to it, and it's also got the highest thermal resistance compared to your calcium carbonate and all these other minerals, biofilm is much, much, much 
more thermal resistance. So the heat exchange is not going to be very good when it starts to foul up. They're going to have to clean that in order for the evaporator to work properly. So one of the theories is due to the sanitation, we're helping remove some of that biofilm and as opposed to depositing and getting down the evaporator, we're stopping that generation potentially and they're not getting on the, on the evaporators and the stuff's not depositing on it. And then the other theory is we're getting a lot of the, a lot of the minerals and stuff, like I said, silica and things of that nature out early in the process and they're falling out in the clarifier. So much more work to be done, uh, many more mills we want to try it in, and, and every mill is different, so repeated results is what we're looking for, but so far it's been very interesting information. Uh, the last thing, manganese mass balance, and why do we look at this? Well, as we mentioned, the, the product is manganese dioxide when there's a reaction from sucrox. It's insoluble. As we said, it helps with the clarification, but we definitely don't want it to go all the way into the raw sugar product or cause real high elevated levels in the molasses. So what we did is we tracked and we sampled from six different locations, crusher juice, clarifier in, clarifier out, mixed juice, uh, final molasses, raw brown sugar, and we took those and we ran it and we got the manganese level and tracked it. And as we can see, What's interesting is at the end, you're putting manganese in and you're getting more out than when it's not treated with sucrox, which is pretty much the way permanganate works in your average water plant. You add manganese to remove manganese. And that's exactly what we saw. And just like a water plant, it deposits in the clarifier. That's where we want it to fall out. It helps with the clarification. The polymer flocks it and drops it out with the solids. And that's exactly what we saw. Uh, and we did these at every mill. We did probably two, three samplings a week. So we've got a lot of data and can definitely confirm that feeding the sucrox, there's, there's nothing getting into the final product. Uh, future work, uh, char continued characterization of sucrox, improved sanitation. Uh, we want to look at reactions with <coughs> dextrans and polysaccharides. We tried to look at some of that, not sure, you know, we need to get real heavy into science and, and continue to look at that and see, you know, what effect we're truly having on that. Um, continue to look at the improvements on the sugar purity, the impurity profiles that we went through. And again, continue to understand that and look at the mechanism of what's actually behind all that. Finally, characterize the clarifier improvements. We need to do repeat the same thing we did at the mill this year, do it at several mills and look at the effect and, and see what if it's having the same effect. Different clarifier, different mill, definitely something to look into. And finally, the evaporator scale. You know, let's look, let's continue to look. We've got two theories, we need to narrow it down to one. So we're gonna continue to definitely look at that. That's all I have. I'm going to turn it over to our partner in crime, the USDA, and Ms. Stephanie Boone. Hi. Um, you basically know me very well. My name is Dr. Stephanie Boone. I work for the USDA. And uh, we've been working, I guess it's going on three years now, with um, Karis on trying to figure out exactly what's going on and some um, replacements. So I'm going to start from picking up where he was talking about uh, dextrin and biofilm, because when we were out in factories, we found something a little bit, I, I really stopped that somebody, something a little bit odd. They, um, there were several people out there that didn't exactly know what, they kept calling everything dextrin. Anything looked like a fish egg, anything that was clear, it, it was dextrin. Anything was slimy, it was dextrin. And that's not necessarily what's going on, it's, it's a bit difficult. Um, or would not difficult, but a bit more complicated. Basically, um, dextrin is a secreted polysaccharide. It's secreted by several different types of bacteria. Leuconostop is the one that's more prevalent usually in the sugar cane factory, but it can also come from some types of yeast um, and other different types of bacteria, uh, Pseudomonas, uh, Serratia, those types of things. And uh, there's several different, there's a couple of different types. One of the biggest ones that you're going to see on a regular basis is over here on your um, right. You'll see just kind of a viscous looking kind of 
we just kind of we'll be dripping things. That's basically soluble uh, dextran. Soluble dextran has um, it's less branch, it's more fluid, it gets in the juice and kind of flows along. What um, you're going to see in a lot of surfaces is going to be, and I'll get into this a little bit later, you're going to get the insoluble dextran that's going to form um, a, um, <coughs> the polysaccharide is going to start to form what we call biofilm. And I'll get into that in the next slide. And this is on your left. Do you see that kind of lump? The reason this formed was because it had grass and, well, not grass, but sugarcane byproduct and other things in there, the whole byproducts from plants. And it actually was forming around the uh, small stalks of the sugar cane. Okay, in the middle, what you see is basically um, a TEM picture, a scanning microscope picture of what it looks like um, just on the microbial level. Very, very small, and you see the branches, this, is this, that, and the other. So the bacteria, the little round things, and then the branches of the slime was and things going on. But, um, they have different weights. You can have very, very large dextrans that are, are heavy and are hard to break down. And you have the soluble ones or the small ones that are usually produced by lipinostocks that are just a little bit easier to break down. There are two types of cells in the, um, two types of microbial cells that you find in the factory. The ones that are floating around or free floating out in the juice are called uh, Plantonic cells. They basically, the plantonic cells are basically just free floating cells, and these are the ones that we have been um, sampling or looking for when you look at the juice and those, of those types of things. The other type is called a sessile cell. The sessile cell basically is a little bitty community. Think about it as a city. What happens is the deck strand, you've got a lot of different bacteria, and the bacteria, um, they settle on a surface. Usually it's in fact it's a metal surface or some other type of surface and it's this goop that you see kind of on um, in the mill and the um, in the mills and stuff like that. It does not dislodge very easily, so the juice can be formed past it, but it doesn't let go or anything else. And so what you're finding is um, these this little community settles on the surfaces and it starts to build up. It's covered by the dextrin of the polysaccharide, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is the collection that you're seeing um, throughout the building of the surface, the uh, building of the surface bio, uh, biofilm. What purpose this serves with the microorganisms is protection. It's protection from um, any type of biocides or liquids or chemicals. It also serves as food. They have little canals in these um, biofilms that uh, the food will go in and out, the waste will go in and out. So they have a happy little community, and they're not really giving that up for anybody um, as, as a result. Um, over time, this will start to shed and get into the juice and this, that, and the other. And some places have different types. You have some that has a lot of, some that has yeast in it, fungi in it, uh, um, with bacteria some protozoa, they're all mixed up in there together in this community. And um, what you are using as a bias that can affect this or what type of chemicals or anything else can affect actually what's in that um, bias. So not everything that you see that's gray and lumpy is a, uh, is has to do with dextran. Um, and so we're trying to get that a little bit thing. We, um, since we're out a little bit, we didn't get to do as much uh, We've got, we got to do, collect a lot of samples during the 